Exactly 100 years ago, in 1920, the fastest sprinting record in 100 meters was 10.6 seconds. A lot of people thought that it's the limit, and this record will never be broken, and it's beyond human capabilities. Slowly but surely, it kept breaking, and in 1968, multiple sprinters broke 10 second barrier sprinting 100 meters in 9.9 .9 seconds. Then again, people thought that's it, it's the limit. But now in 2020, we have Usain Bolt who currently holds the record of 9.58 seconds and known as the fastest man on the planet. Even now, you can find some people saying that no one can break the current record. Is this really true? Let's dissect the whole engineering behind running. If you have watched the previous video about natural theoretical limits, you know that we humans are not the fastest animals. And this is immediately obvious from our anatomy. For example, we have heavy calf muscles way down on our legs. The calves must swing back and forth at every leg stroke and require a lot of force to allow any increase of the frequency of the steps. Considering that our muscles have few fast trigger fibers, a frequency of about 5 steps per second, 300 steps per minute is an upper limit for the capacity of our leg muscles to contract and extend. Cheetahs, ostriches, horses, and even dogs and cats have all the leg muscles bundled way up their legs and connected to their lower point of action by long tendons. This way, free of muscles, the lower part of their legs is very light and can swing at a much higher frequency. Their short muscles being closer to the point of rotation of the hip don't have to move so much as our long leg muscles. And the force needed to swing a large, muscle-free, very light leg is a lot less than the force needed to swing the massive, muscular human leg. So this is the first reason why most mammals are faster than us. We also have a rather short foot. The foot is extra leverage that allows us to use the power of the calf muscles. When we walk, as opposed to running, the calf muscles are used very little. The foot acts as a gear. The shorter, the lighter the gear, the higher the force, but the lower the speed. The human foot allows the calf muscle to exert a lot of force on the toes, but not much speed. A longer foot will provide less power but greater speed, like a taller gear. If you look at runner animals like cheetah, horses, or simply your domestic dogs and cats, they all walk on their toes, and their feet are very long, sometimes as long as the other leg bones. We humans are like a motor vehicle with a gearbox stuck in the second gear, while runner animals benefit from a tall gear for fast running. So if we can swing our legs at a frequency of about 5 steps per second, and each step can be 2.5 meters long, this means that the top speed of a human cannot exceed 12.5 meters per second, which is equal to 45 kilometers per hour, no matter how strong our legs are. These numbers may apply to Usain Bolt. For an average human, the maximum speed will be more like 30 kilometers per hour. But the new research shows that, if we manage time that applies force to the ground while sprinting, our limbs and muscles can go faster, and theoretically we can run 64 km per hour at the max. 64 km per hour is fast, but not as much as fast running animals. A fit human cannot outrun a bear, let alone a horse or a large dog, but we theoretically can outrun all of them on the long distance. It's often believed that humans are weak and fragile animals that manage to get through the hardship of the fight for survival by virtue of their large brains. This is not the whole story. It's not much appreciated that humans, given certain conditions, can outrun any land mammal on the long distance, even camels, cheetahs, horses, and any other animal. We might not be the fastest, but we are the best marathon runners on the planet. You might be asking, how is that possible? Well, that's because of the three extraordinary evolutionary traits of humans. We have the most efficient water cooling system in the animal world, and we are the only animal with a two gear shifter, and we are among the very few land animals to have rear wheels. Well, hind legs. Let's see the first reason. Water cooling. Muscles, like all engines, produce heat. This is because the chemical energy they receive from the blood cannot be entirely converted in mechanical energy, but only a fraction of it. The rest becomes heat. 
Heat is good for us, we are homeothermic, hot-blooded species, and our body temperature must be comprised within a very narrow range to allow us to live and thrive. Too much heat, if not sufficiently dissipated, will raise the body temperature and put our very survival at risk. The muscles of a mammal have an efficiency of about 18-26%. to 26%. This means that 18-26% to 26 of the energy that comes from the blood is converted in mechanical energy, and the remaining 74-82% to 82 is either not drawn from the blood or is converted into heat. That's a lot of heat if you think about it, and it's very difficult to dissipate adequately. Mainly, heat is dissipated through the skin, and the surface of the skin is just too much. As the body grows bigger, its volume increases with the cubic power of its linear dimensions, which are length and height, and its outer surface increases only with the square power. If you double the length of an animal, all the rest remaining equal, its body volume will increase 8 times, its skin surface 4 times. So a big animal will soon meet a deficit of a body surface through which to dissipate the heat produced by its muscles. The evolutionary solutions to these problems are multiple. For example, elephants have developed large ears with a dense network of blood vessels that act as a radiators to dissipate heat. Other animals placed a limit to the amount of heat they produce by reducing muscle metabolism when they need to produce long duration efforts and other animals have just started sweating. So how does sweating help dissipate heat? Water requires a lot of heat to evaporate, almost 2300 joules, 550 calories per each gram of liquid water that becomes vapor. Water does not have to be taken to its boiling point to evaporate. In essence, it can evaporate at any temperature if energy is given to it in different ways. For example, by a current of air that flows by its surface. Now imagine having your skin constantly wet and the current of air generated by running makes this layer of water evaporate. Continuous sweating replaces the water that evaporates. Every gram of water that evaporates will remove 2300 joules of heat from your skin. Your skin blood vessels will transfer heat from the blood to the skin and from there to the water. An athlete can produce as many as 3 liters of sweat per hour. This corresponds to 3000 grams, and if they all evaporate, they will require nearly 7 million joules of energy. If this is done in one hour, it's equal to almost 2 kilowatts of cooling power. So we humans have a cooling system that can reach nearly 2 kilowatts of thermal power. It removes much of the heat produced by our muscles and allows us to keep our body temperature stable even under a continuous and intense muscular effort. Assuming a cooling efficiency of 100% which is never reached, we could ideally generate a continuous muscular power of 0.6 to 0.9 horsepower. So this is why we have no fur. Fur would insulate the layer of the sweat that lies on the skin, preventing the air current from making it evaporate. Horses also sweat, but their fur, however short, is very difficult to evaporate water than on the bare skin of a human and heat transmission is far worse across a thick layer of liquid water trapped in the fur, as anyone who has been sweating through a flannel shirt has experienced. Humans have the most efficient water cooling system in the animal world. But there is more, unique among all animals, humans can switch from plantigrade deambulation to digitigrade deambulation at will. When we walk, we place the entire foot on the ground, and we exploit the leverage offered by the length of the foot only to lift the weight of the leg a short distance. We almost do not use our calf muscles to walk. Why? Because less muscle mass is used, less energy is consumed, less heat is produced. Walking is a slow but extremely energy efficient way to move. Cats, dogs, horses and all other running animals always move on their toe tips, no matter how slow they want to go. They cannot put their calf muscles at rest, and their slow walking pace is not as efficient as it could be, were they able to walk on their soles as humans and bears do. When we want to run, however, we just shift to a higher gear. We do not put the whole sole of our feet on the ground anymore, and we run on our toes. We mostly use, so to speak, cushions of the feet behind the toes, with the toes acting as balancers. 
This way, the calf muscles can generate a strong force acting on the leverage provided by the length of the foot to lift the entire weight of the body and we can sufficiently use many more muscles when running than when walking. So we have two gears, a light one for energy efficient slow walking and a tall one for strong fast running or climbing. Although our species adapted to running, it never became a fast runner, because a long foot necessary to allow fast running would have become rather awkward and useless when walking in the first gear. Last but not least, the third reason is that unique among mammals, we walk solely on our hind legs. We share this ability only with running birds. Most two-legged animals are actually four-legged that occasionally walk on their hind legs. For example, bears, apes, monkeys and lemurs. Australians here might dispute that kangaroos and wallabies are also bipedal, but the fact is, they don't walk at all. Rather, their evolution led to even more radical transformation and they became two-legged pogo sticks, where the two legs can only move at the same time as they were one. Kangaroos and wallabies are, by all means, one leg deambulators, at least from a functional point of view. We humans became the ultramarathon runners of the animal kingdom. No other animal is able to run for 8 hours to 16 km per hour in a hot climate. A horse can run much faster than a man, but after 1 hour even less in a warm climate, they have to stop and cool off or they will die from a heart stroke. In a cold environment, the problem of body heating is not so relevant. Sledge dogs can run for 200 km at sub-zero temperatures and also horses travel longer and faster in the cold. But humans are unbeatable for their endurance in a hot climate. Arabic camels are often cited as one of the best endurance runners of the animal kingdom and they have a wholly different strategy for men to endure efforts like horses. They cannot sustain strong efforts for long. Camels are designed to spear water. Because of the environments they have evolved in, they cannot afford to sweat like we do. If they do, their body temperature would rapidly increase and overclock. A camel can travel for 8 to 10 hours, but at the speed of a fast walking human. Also, a human can do that. In fact, most people in a caravan of camels crossing a desert walk alongside the camels. But humans can also do better. They can run the same distance in a less time than a camel. During the Great Australian Camel Race that was held in 1988, the winner actually walked and ran alongside his camel for 3,200 km from Ares Rock to Gold Coast. Men and camel had the same long distance performance. All this thanks to sweating, legs that allowed both efficient walking and running, and to bipedal deambulation. It would be incorrect if I say humans are the best marathon runners, but in truth, we are one of the best runners. Proghorn antelopes, the only ones who can make a competition. It's either us or the proghorns. Let me break it down for you. Proghorn has the ability to lope at 50 km per hour for 3 to 4 hours at a stretch. If the need arises, it can cruise at 70 km per hour. The windpipe of a proghorn is twice as wide as ours. Compared to a goat of a similar size, its lungs are 3 times larger. All of that oxygen is absorbed by a larger blood volume and pumped by a larger heart. The result? A proghorn can process 5 times more oxygen than a typical mammal and 3 times more than a human runner. Additionally, a larger heart and lungs mean its stomach is smaller, so if your stomach is full or have food inside, running a marathon is extremely hard. Proghorns in Wyoming perform a 250 to 500 km yearly migration that takes them about 3 to 4 days for the whole pack, young and old. But the evidence for the argument that we human species are the best at endurance running is that in 2005, the guy named Dean Carnesis had run 563 km without ever stopping. He ran for 80 hours, 44 minutes, without a break. It's completely insane. No other mammal can do that. A lot of ultramarathon athletes run for hundreds of miles in a short period of time, which solidifies the argument that we are not only the smartest, but the best endurance runners on the planet. Well, thanks for watching. Please support the channel on Patreon and subscribe if you didn't. Hit the notification button not to miss upcoming episodes and hit the like button if you genuinely liked the video. If you didn't like it, comment down below so we can discuss it.